If we go to our PC, if you recall, our host device is the Windows installer itself. We're actually going to go and change that. The way you change that is you go to your host here, you click this button, CD, and you actually change it to another thing. And another thing here for us is the vCenter server appliance. We actually want to mount that drive instead. So we will edit the machine settings and we will tell it, use the host device. So right now, it's changing the CD-ROM drive from using the data store ISO file with a Windows installer to using the host attached CD-ROM to this Windows machine we deployed, the, the main controller. It has Linux, Mac, and Windows installers. If you go to Windows 32, at the very bottom, you will find the installer for the vCenter server. So we're going to run that. Now, vCenter server options we will have a couple of things to choose and we'll just write them down so we remember. vCenter is deployed in two stages. One is the appliance deployment and then it's appliance configuration. First is the deployment, so we will go through with this. We want a vCenter server with an embedded platform services controller. This is the default and also recommended setting for a vCenter server. There used to be a way to deploy platform services controllers separately and throughout the years VMware has changed their mind on which way is actually the preferred method. They went from an integrated one to a separate one back to an integrated one. So if in doubt, go with the default, even if this is production. Then it's asking us for the ESXi host. That's our esxo1.sylphanpath.com. And the reason why this FQDN works is because we added it into our DNS uh, just a few minutes ago. If you go here, there it is. Port 443, root, and the password you set for the ESXi host. Accept the fingerprint for authenticating this SSL. So what's the vCenter machine we, we have? Well, we said we're going to call it a VC. So VC it is. Root password for the machine. You can keep it same as your host since this is a lab. However, if this wasn't a lab and it was production, I would highly recommend having them different. Now your deployment size. That's the first setting. We're going with tiny. And the reason is tiny is really tiny and this is just a lab, so that's all we need. Uh, storage size we just won't default, but if you read in this table here, we'll tell you Tiny will be deploying a vCenter with two CPUs, 10 gigs of RAM, 250 gigs of storage. It can support up to 10 ESXi hosts and up to 100 VMs with this deployment. We're not going to be nowhere near those limits in the lab. We're probably going to have just two hosts and maybe 10, 15 VMs, so that's perfect. For production uses, you would want this to either be small, which is usually decent, or a medium, just to make it a little bit better and more robust for the growth that you want to account for. Tiny it is for us. Now, there are two options when it comes to where do we want to deploy this vCenter server. As you know, we only have one drive currently, one data store configured, which is the ESX01, which is our boot drive. However, we don't want to deploy there because it's too little. We actually want to set up the VMware vSAN with one host right now during our deployment of vCenter and then add more hosts to it for redundancy. So we will choose the vSAN cluster setting. The data center name will be just DC01 and our cluster name will be cluster01. You can name this however you want. This is just going to create a vCenter hierarchy with DC being DC01 being the data center 01 and the cluster underneath it under which the host will sit named cluster 01. Now it comes time to claim your disks for the vSAN configuration and this is where this part comes into play. Remember when we created a 120 gigabyte vSAN cache drive and then we created two 200 gigabytes for the data tier? This is exactly where we tell it that. So our 120 is cached here. However, these two, we want them to actually be capacity tier. 
and you can see that it clearly marked these as flash because in my case these are not spinning drives this is actually m.2 nvme drive underneath it all so flash is perfect and for vsan you really want to go all flash hybrid deployments are possible but they're not the best performing in this case this is exactly what we have you have a couple of options you can enable a thin disk provisioning mode uh, so we don't pre-allocate storage when we deploy virtual machines and you can also enable deduplication and compression these slow down the storage a little bit however they enable you to store much more data than it is possible on these systems by utilizing deduplication and compression technologies I'm going to leave the duplication and compression off because I don't want to bother with performance decrease on this particular setup because it is a lab and it's all really running virtualized. We will just let it all utilize space as it needed. When it comes to the network, this is where the network we created earlier comes into play. So if you recall, under networking, we created another switch, which was the SP management. And we created a port group, which was the SP management port group. That's really the reason why we did it. We're going to go to this network. It's IPv4 static system name. System name means FQDN of your vCenter server. And that's going to be vc.sylphanpath.com. IP address is going to be as we defined here. 172.17.1.10. Two five five two five five zero, which is a slash twenty four net mask. One seven two seventeen dot one dot two is the gateway. Remember, don't forget on Fusion gateways that two, and the DNS server is one seven two seventeen dot one dot five, which is our domain controller or one. Later on, we can add another one once we deploy it. But for now, you want to only use what you actually have deployed. So there we go. It's a tiny deployment and these are our settings and configurations. We'll hit finish. The reason why vCenter FQDN works is for the same reason as the ESXi host when we were connecting. We added it here. If we did not have VC zone record here and if this reverse record did not exist right here, which was automatically created when we created the zone and chose the setting to create a pointer as well, vCenter deployment would most likely fail. So it is very important to have a working DNS server with a correct A record and a reverse DNS pointer record set up before deploying a vCenter. So I'll see you when this is done. Well, that took a moment. So the step one of deploying vCenter appliance is now complete. If we hit continue, we'll actually continue with the step two. If you ever lose this screen for any reason, you can actually now go to the appliance itself at the port 5480 and continue with the step two. Also, this is the reason why this is a very good time to actually snapshot this vCenter appliance because if anything fails in a step two, or if we ever want to go back and actually redeploy or reconfigure the appliance differently we don't have to redeploy again we can save this state for later so if we go to virtual machines we will simply snapshot this and say step one complete appliance has been deployed nothing is configured on it vCenter is not running we simply take a snapshot of this now we can continue to step two and actually configure our vCenter without ever worrying of this step failing or having to redo the step one again. So we want to synchronize time with NTP server and our NTP server is our domain controller. And we want to enable SSH so that we can SSH into the appliance itself. Now, this is where you create the single sign-on domain that actually lives on the platform services controller which lives inside this appliance together with the vCenter. This is a single sign-on for all things vCenter and you do not want to use uh, your domain here that we already set up for example for the domain controller. This should not be sylphanpath.com. 
because in, if it is set up this way, you will never be able to join your vCenter and single sign-on with your domain for authentication. So this has to be something else. And I honestly like leaving this as vSphere.local because every other deployment is just like this. You could call it something else that local. You could call it sylphonpath vSphere that local if you want to be a little different to maybe stop from brute force attacks of somebody trying to log in using vSphere that local which is usually default everywhere but again if you have someone brute forcing logging into your vCenter server you have bigger issues so for me I'm going to go with vSphere that local because I just like it now the site name, if you're deploying multiple different sites that are all going to join this platform services controller and your vCenter into one single sign on domain, you can actually name this like HQ1 or HQLA or whatever it is, right? Uh, for me, this is just the lab and there is there won't be any other. So I'm gonna call this one Sylphen Lab. That's my site. Maybe I'll have Sylph in production in the cloud later on, and then that's how we will distinguish or differentiate between the two. So Sylph and Lab is my site. I'll join the VMware programs. And these are our settings. So the, the NTP we're connecting to, and the SSO that we set up, vSphere.local, with administrator at vSphere.local being the login for the vCenter once it's deployed. And we hit finish. There is no way to pause this. It's just warning you once it starts deploying, there's no coming back. So what you can do now is you can actually open a console in a new window here and potentially even see when this one reboots once it's all set up and done. If it even reboots, I don't remember. But now that's what we're deploying. The appliance is already on the network. It's actually reachable. And that's why we can actually go to vc.sylphonpath.com at the port 5480 because there is no vCenter remember and it will actually respond as you can see here if you log in while it's deploying the step two you can actually watch the progress as well so you can either watch it right here where you had the whole installer and setup or on to on the port 5480 whichever you prefer now again another waiting game once this is done I'll see you back here. All right. So that one completed as well. As you can see here, it tells you where to go in order to access it. And now we were on port 5480, which is we use for configuration. We can simply click here and access it without the port at the very end. There are two ways to access vSphere. One is using the Flash client and one is using HTML5. Since we are on vSphere version 6.5, the HTML5 has partial functionality. I believe on 6.7 it has much more. However, we'll deal with HTML5 once we upgrade to 6.7. For now, I just like to stick with the good old Flash version on the 6.5. Our username here is administrator vSphere.local. So we're going to be using the domain you set up for vSphere. Administrator at vSphere.local with the password you set up in that step two. The very first time vSphere takes a moment until you load because a lot of things are initializing the databases and other configuration settings. But after this first login, it's usually faster. Sometimes if you see this just sitting here, if you're in a Firefox, you can click on this and hit allow flash to proceed and then sometimes it will actually just refresh like this and then load in. Well, here we are. So if you recall a couple of settings when we were deploying the vCenter, first one was that the main was at uh, the data center was called EC1. We gave it the cluster name, a cluster 01. Our host is now underneath it. And the two virtual machines that we have are there as well. If you look at the cluster, under configure settings, general under vSEN, you will see that VMware vSEN is deployed. It has three disks. Under disk management, we can see what those disks are. Here is the disk group containing our 120 gigabyte vSEN cache drive. 
and two 200 gigabyte data tier drives, which were the ones we defined earlier. So vSAN is currently set. However, there is no vSAN network currently deployed. So if we add another host and try to provision vSAN there, it won't work. There is a lot of setup still left here to perform. However, at this point, I will end this particular video. Part ends with vCenter server actually being installed and ready. We will only do two more things before I end this video. The first thing we would like to do, go to our host, go to configuration, go to VMware startup and shutdown, and actually configure automatic startup and shutdown of our machines on this host. We will put delays to two minutes and they can continue immediately if VMware tools are detected. And we want automatic startup of our DC1 followed by automatic startup of our vCenter server if DC01 is up and running and has vSphere uh, VMware tools already activated. vCenter will only start after DC01 is actually started or two minutes after that which is plenty of time for the main controller and DNS services to get up and running so that vCenter can actually start without any issues. So this automatic startup will enable us to shut down our lab completely. And when we start our hosts, they will automatically start the domain controller and the vCenter server. And the second thing that is left to do is to actually create one more snapshot here on our vCenter server so that we can go back to it in case we mess up something in the subsequent upcoming videos. This one we will call step two complete, no configuration other than vCenter server up and running. That is literally all we have done. With this snapshot here, we can go and shut down our host, do whatever we want with it, start it back up, the main controller will start, the vCenter server will start, and everything will be ready for us to actually use as you see here. I hope you enjoyed this part of setting up a VMware vCenter server lab on top of a Mac Pro. In the next video, we're going to go through adding the second host, configuring the networks, deploying a distributed virtual switch, migrating machines off of the standard switches onto the distributed virtual switches, configuring VMware vSAN network, and deploying a couple of virtual machines, which is the whole reason for having a lab, is to actually run other things. This is just the infrastructure piece that supports it all. So stay safe, wash your hands, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.